Chapter Fourteen, Part Two of Famous Sea Fights by John R. Hale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. Famous Sea Fights by John R. Hale. Chapter Fourteen, Part Two. Their appearance without the fleet to which they belonged led to many conjectures. The Japanese at once grasped its real meaning. To quote the message cabled by the Tokyo correspondent of the Times, they read it as a plain intimation that Raj Dysvinsky intended to put his fate to the test at Tsushima, since, had it been his purpose to make for Sugaru or Soya, he must have retained the services of these auxiliary ships during several days longer. It is apparent, indeed, that the Russian admiral here made his first cardinal mistake. He should have kept his non-combatant vessels out of sight as long as possible. Their absence from the arena would have been a mysterious element, whereas their apparition, especially as a segregated squadron in the Yangtze River, furnished an unerring clue to expert observers. With the fleet the Admiral retained only the hospital and repairing ships, and those laden with naval stores for the Vladivostok dockyard. On the evening of the 25th the fleet stood out to sea, heading for Tsushima. The weather was bad, with a probability that it would be worse. There was a rising wind and sea, with cold rain that made a blinding haze. But the Russian staff officers were rather pleased than depressed at such unpleasant conditions. Thick weather would baffle the Japanese scouts and lookout stations, and rough seas would keep their torpedo flotillas at anchor. Out ahead were the fast cruisers of the scouting division, the Svetlana, Almaz, and the Ural. After these came the main body of the fleet, in line ahead in two columns the heavy armor-clads on the starboard right side, the rest of the armored ships and four cruisers in the port line. Abreast of the leading ships, each flank was guarded by a cruiser and two torpedo destroyers. After the fighting lines, and between their foaming wakes, steamed four storeships and two repairing ships. Last of all were the two steamers fitted as hospital ships. The arrangement is best shown by a rough diagram. Leading were the cruisers, Svetlana in the middle, Almaz on the port, and Ural on the starboard. Port line. The Imperator Nikolai, the Admiral Senyavin, the Admiral Apraxin, the Admiral Yushikov, cruisers Oleg, Aurora, Dmitri Donskoy, and Alexander Monomok, and five torpedo destroyers. They were flanked on their port side by the cruiser Jemshug and two torpedo destroyers. The starboard line. The Kanea Suvorov, the Imperator Alexander, the Borodino, the Orel, the Asliabia, the Sasoy Valiki, the Navarin, and the Admiral Nakamov. They were flanked on their starboard side by the cruiser Izumrud and two torpedo destroyers. Behind and to the center were the storeships Anadur, Irtish, Korea, Kamshatka, repairing ships and tugs, Sphere and Russ, and hospital ships Oral and Castromo. In this order the great fleet steamed slowly through the rain and darkness. On board the great battleships there was much grumbling at Nabogatov's old tubs, though they themselves could not do much better, for poor coal, inefficient stoking, and weed-grown bottom plates handicapped even the newest of them. The next day, 26 May, was the eve of the greatest naval battle in all history. The clouds began to break, and the sun shone fitfully, says Captain Semenov. But although a fairly fresh southwesterly wind had sprung up, a thick mist still lay upon the water. Rajdysvinsky meant to pass the perilous straits in daylight, and he calculated that by noon next day the fleet would be in the narrows of Tsushima. Behind that portal of the Sea of Japan, Togo was waiting confidently for his enemy, who, he knew, must now be near at hand. Never before had two such powerful fleets met in battle, and the fate of the East hung upon the result of their encounter. That result must depend mainly upon the heavy armored ships. In these, and in a number of guns of the largest caliber, the Russians had an advantage so far as mere figures went, as the following tables show. Armored Ships Battleship Class Japan 4, Russia 8 Coast Defense Armored Clad Class Japan None, Russia 3 Armored Cruiser Class Japan 8, 
Russia 3. Total armored ships, Japan 12, Russia 14. Heavy guns, 12-inch, Japan 16, Russia 26. 10-inch, Japan 1, Russia 15. 9-inch, Japan 0, Russia 4. 8-inch, Japan 30, Russia 8. Quick firers, 6-inch, Japan 160, Russia 102. 4.7-inch, Japan none, Russia 30. With regard to the armor, it must be kept in mind, for purposes of comparison, that the armored belts of the newest ships, nine inches at the thickest part, were of harveyized or Krupp steel, and could resist penetration better than the thicker belts of the older ships. It will be noticed that the Japanese carried fewer of the heavier types of guns, but had more six-inch quick firers than the Russians. This is a point to bear in mind in following the story of the battle. It was the steady rain of one hundred pounder shells from the quick firers that paralyzed the fighting power of the Russian ships. Far more important than the mere number of guns was the fact that the Japanese shot straighter and had a more effective projectile. There was such a marked difference between the effect of the Japanese shells at Tsushima and in the naval battle of 10 August 1904 that Captain Simonov, who was present at both battles, thought that in the interval the Japanese must have adopted a more powerful kind of high explosive for their bursting charges. This was not the case. Throughout the war the Japanese had used for their bursting charges the famous Chimo's powder. But perhaps between 10 August 1904 and the following May they had improved their fuses so as to detonate the charge more certainly and thoroughly. The first five battleships on the Russian list were up-to-date modern vessels. The Navarone was fairly fit to lie in line with them. The rest were, to use a familiar expression, a scratch lot, coast defense ships of small speed and old craft quite out of date. The decks of the larger ships were encumbered with an extra supply of coal, and this must have seriously diminished their margin of stability, with, as we shall see, disastrous results. Admiral Togo could oppose to them only four modern battleships, but his two heavy cruisers, the Nishin and Kasuga, the ships bought from Argentina on the eve of the war, might almost have been classed as smaller battleships, and certainly would have been given that rank a few years earlier. His fine fleet of armored cruisers were at least a match for the Russian coast defense ships and the older battleships. Besides his armored ships, Admiral Rajdestvensky had a squadron of six protected cruisers under Rear Admiral Enquist, whose flag flew in the Oleg, a vessel of 6,750 tons launched in 1903 and completed next year. She had for her principal armament twelve six-inch quick-firers. The other cruisers were the Aurora, of a little over 6,000 tons, the Svetlana, of nearly 4,000, the Jemshug, and the Izumrud, of 3,000 tons, these two armed with 47 quick-firing guns, and the Almaz, of 3,285, a scout of good speed, carrying nothing heavier than twelve-pounders. There was one auxiliary cruiser, the Ural, a flotilla of nine destroyers, four transports, two repairing ships, and two hospital steamers. Awaiting the battle in sight of his own shores, Togo had concentrated as auxiliary squadrons to his armored fleet a considerable number of protected cruisers and a whole swarm of torpedo craft. At this stage of her naval development, and on the eve of a life-and-death struggle, Japan had no idea of scrapping even the older ships. Anything that could carry a few good guns, and brave men to fight them, might be useful. So even the old Chinese ironclad, which had carried Ting's flag at the Yalu battle, a ship dating from 1882, was under steam in one of the auxiliary squadrons, with four new twelve-inch guns in her barbettes. There were three of these auxiliary squadrons, commanded by Rear Admiral Dewa, Rear Admiral Yuryu, and Rear Admiral Keteoka, the last having as a subordinate commander Rear Admiral Togo, a relative of the commander-in-chief. Dewa's flag flew in the Kasagi, a fine cruiser of nearly five thousand tons, built in America, and he had with him her sister ships, the Chaitos and the Takasago. Yuryu's flag flew in the Naniwa, Togo's ship when he was a captain in the Chinese War. Several of the fine cruisers which Ito had then led to victory were present, many of them remodeled, and all provided with new guns. 
Then there were a number of small protected cruisers, built in Japanese dockyards since the Chinese War, the heralds of the later time when the Japanese Navy would all be home-built. Battleships, armored cruisers, and protected cruisers were all swifter than the Russian ships. The fleet as a whole could maneuver at fully fifty percent greater speed than the enemy, and this meant that it could choose its own position in battle. The five torpedo squadrons included two or three torpedo gunboats, twenty-one fine destroyers, and some eighty torpedo boats. Togo's plans had the simplicity which is a necessity in the rough game of war, where elaborate schemes are likely to go wrong. Some of the swift protected cruisers were scouting south of the Straits. The fleet was anchored in a body in Masampo Bay, and in wireless communication with its scouts. The armored fleet was to make the main attack on the head of the Russian advance. The protected cruiser squadrons were to sweep round the enemy's flanks, fall upon his rear, and destroy his transports and auxiliaries. The torpedo flotilla was to be ready to dash in and complete the defeat of the enemy when his fleet was crippled by the fight with the heavy ships. Most of the officers and men of the Russian fleet had the dogged courage that could carry them through even a hopeless fight, but they looked forward to the immediate future with forebodings of disaster. Even among the officers on board the great Suvorov, there was a feeling that the most that could be hoped for was that a few ships would struggle through to Vladivostok if there was a battle and that the best thing that could happen would be for the thick weather and rough seas to enable them to avoid anything like a close fight with the Japanese. During the last day before the fight, Rostisvinsky, who did not want to hurry forward, but was timing his advance so as to pass the straits in the middle of the next day, spent some time in maneuvers. Captain Simonov's notes on the proceedings convey a useful lesson. Once again, he says, and for the last time, we were forcibly reminded of the old truism that a fleet is created by long practice at sea in time of peace, cruising, not remaining in port, and that a collection of ships of various types, hastily collected, which have only learned to sail together on the way to the theater of operations, is no fleet, but a chance concourse of vessels. Wireless telegraphy had come into use since the last naval war, and a fleet could now try to overhear the aerial messages of an enemy. In the Russian fleet, the order had been given that no wireless messages were to be sent. In other words, the operators were to keep silence, and listen by watching their apparatus. In the morning of the 26th, they thought they detected messages passing. In the evening, these were more frequent. Short messages of a word or two was the interpretation that the experts in the signal cabins put upon the unintelligible flickerings of the indicator, and they suggested that they were mere negative code signals from the Japanese scouts to their main fleet, repeating an indication that they were on the alert and had seen nothing. This was mere guesswork, however, and Politovsky's diary on the voyage shows that near the Cape, at Madagascar, and out in the midst of the Indian Ocean, Rajdasvinsky's wireless operators had thought that they detected Japanese aerial signaling, simply because the receivers gave indications they could not understand. Possibly these were merely the effect of electric storms on the apparatus. Once or twice on 26 May they thought they could read fragments of sentences, such as, Last night, nothing, eleven lights, not in line. The short messages in the evening came at fixed times. This showed that prearranged signaling was really going on. It gave the impression that perhaps the fleet was being watched by unseen enemies. As the sun went down, the ships closed up and half the officers were detailed for duty at the guns during the hours of darkness. The rest lay down fully dressed, ready to turn out at a moment's notice. Many slept on the decks. No lights were shown. Simonov's description of that night of anxious expectation is worth quoting. He was on board the flagship, the Suvorov. The night came on dark. The mist seemed to grow denser, and through it but few stars could be seen. On the dark deck there prevailed a strained stillness broken at times only by the sighs of the sleepers, the steps of an officer, or by an order given in an undertone. Near the guns the motionless figures of their crews seemed like dead, but all were wide awake, gazing keenly into the darkness. Was not that the dark shadow of a torpedo boat? They listened attentively. Surely the throb of her engines and the noise of steam would betray an invisible foe. Stepping carefully so as not to disturb the sleepers, I went round the bridges and decks, 
and then proceeded to the engine-room. For a moment the bright light blinded me. Here life and movement were visible on all sides. Men were nimbly running up and down the ladders. There was a tinkling of bells and a buzzing of voices. Orders were being transmitted loudly, but on looking more intently, the tension and anxiety, that same peculiar frame of mind so noticeable on deck, could also be observed. At daybreak the Japanese scouts were in touch. As the day came in gray light over the misty broken sea, one of their scouts, the auxiliary cruiser, Siano Maru, an armed passenger liner, sweeping round through the haze, almost collided with the hospital ships, and then dashed off and disappeared in the twilight. In former wars she would have had to run back to the fleet with her news. Now from her wireless apparatus the information was sent through the air to the receivers of the Makasa and Masampo Bay, and in a few moments Togo knew that the enemy's fleet was in square number 203 of the chart, apparently steering for the eastern passage, i.e., the strait between Tsushima Island and Japan. In the straits and outside Masampo Bay a heavy sea was running, and though the wind blew strongly from the southwest, the weather was still hazy at sunrise, with patches of fog here and there. The main body of the Japanese fleet began to get up anchor and slip from its moorings. At dawn, Rajdasvinsky had called in the Almaz, leaving the Jemshug and the Izumrud steaming in advance of his two divisions. The six auxiliary ships had closed up, so that the leading ship, the transport Anadir, was abreast in the center of the two lines. The Almaz, Svetlana, and Ural steamed at the rear of the central line of transports to protect them in that direction. The two hospital ships, flying the Red Cross flag and trusting to it for safety, were well astern. About 6 a.m., the huge Ural came running up between the lines, and sent me forward to the flagship that four ships in line ahead were passing across the rear of the fleet, but could not be clearly made out in the mist. They could only be some of Togo's cruisers shepherding the fleet. Just before seven, a fine cruiser was seen some five miles away on the starboard beam of the Suvorov. She closed up to three miles, and was soon identified as the Izumu. The big gun turrets were swung round to bear on her, but the Japanese cruiser, having seen what she wanted, increased her distance, but could be seen still keeping the fleet in sight. Togo's report notes that at 7 a.m. the Izumu sent by wireless the second definite report of the enemy stating that he was twenty-five miles northwest of Ukushima, steering northeast. This would make the Russian position about thirty miles south of the Tsushima Islands, heading for the channel to the east of them. An hour later, about eight a.m., some Japanese ships showed themselves the other side of the fleet. Simonov notes how the Chinyen, Matsushima, Itsukushima, and Hashidat appeared out of the mist, steaming on an almost parallel course. Ahead of them was a small light cruiser, apparently the Akisushu, which hurriedly drew off to the north as soon as we were able to see her well, and equally she us, and the whole squadron began slowly to increase their distance and gradually to disappear from sight. This was Vice Admiral Takeyomi's division, composed of three of the cruisers that had fought at the Yalu battle, eleven years before, and the Chinyen, which had fought against them as the Tingyun. The ship that ran out ahead was the only quick or modern ship in the squadron, the small, Clyde-built, armored cruiser Chiyoda. If Raj Dysvensky had had any speedy cruisers available, he might have severely punished this slow squadron of old ships. Takiomi showed he knew his enemy by thus boldly approaching in the mist. The Russians now realized that they had watchful enemies all around them, and rightly conjectured that they would find the enemy's heavy ships in the straits ready for battle. At 10 a.m. another cruiser squadron appeared on the port beam. This was Dawa's division, made up of the American-built sister ships Kasagi and Chaitos, of nearly 5,000 tons, and two smaller protected cruisers, the Niitaka and Atawa, lately turned out by Japanese yards. They seemed to invite attack. At a signal from the Admiral, the eight armor-clads of the starboard line steamed ahead of the port line, turned together to port, and then, turning again, formed line ahead, leading the whole fleet. At the same time the transports moved out to starboard, guarded by the Vladimir Monomach detached from the port division, the Svetlana, Almaz, and Ural. Dewa's cruisers held a parallel course with the Russian battleships for more than an hour, still apparently unsupported. 
The range was about five miles. At 11.20, the Russians opened fire on them. Semenov says that it was the result of a mistake. The Oral fired an accidental shot, which she immediately reported by semaphore. Unable, with smokeless powder, to tell by which of the leading ships it had been fired, the fleet took it as a signal from the Suvorov and opened fire. Of the whole fleet, the fire of the third squadron was the heaviest. This squadron was made up of Nabogatov's old tubs. Their heavy fire was probably the result of undisciplined excitement. The Japanese fired a few shots in reply, but no harm was done on either side. Rajdzinsky, who had kept the guns of his flagship silent, signaled ammunition not to be wasted, and the firing ceased in five minutes, just as the Japanese turned slowly and increased their distance. Orders were now signaled for the men of the Russian fleet to have their dinners, and the officers lunched in turn. The harmless skirmish encouraged some of the Russian crews with the idea that they had been in action and were none the worse, and had driven the Japanese away. At noon the fleet was due south of Tsushima, which towered like a mountain out of the sea a few miles ahead. The signal was hoisted, change course north 23 degrees east for Vladivostok. It was the anniversary of the Tsar's coronation. Round the wardroom tables, in his doomed fleet, the officers stood up and drank with enthusiasm to the Emperor, the Empress, and victory for Russia. The cheering had hardly died down when the bugle sounded the alarm. Everyone hurried to his post. The enemy's cruisers had again shown themselves, this time accompanied by a flotilla of destroyers, that came rolling through the rough sea with the waves foaming over their bows. On a signal from the admiral, the four leading battleships turned to starboard and stood towards the enemy, then reformed line ahead on a course parallel to the rest of the fleet and slightly in advance of it. The Japanese, on the threat of attack, had turned also and went off at high speed to the northwards. At 1.20 p.m. the admiral signaled to the next four ships of the fleet to join the line of battleships, forming astern of them. The Russian armada was now well into the wide eastern strait of Tsushima, and far ahead through the mist a crowd of ships could be dimly seen. The crisis was near at hand. On receiving the first wireless message from the Shinano Maru at daybreak, Togo had weighed anchor and come out of Musampo Bay, with his main fleet steering east, so as to pass just to the north of Tsushima. He had with him his twelve armored ships, and Rear Admiral Uryu's division of protected cruisers, Naniwa, Takichiko, Tsushima, and Akashi, and a strong flotilla of destroyers. The smaller torpedo boats, more than sixty in number, had been already sent to shelter in Mairua Bay, in the island of Tsushima, on account of the heavy seas. During the morning, Togo received a succession of wireless messages from his cruisers, and every mile of the enemy's progress, every change in his formation, was quickly signaled to him. Shortly after noon, he was able to note that the Russians were entering the straits, steaming at about twelve knots on a northeasterly course, that they were formed in two columns in line ahead, the starboard column being the stronger, and that they had their transports astern between the columns. He decided to attack them on the weaker side at 2 p.m., when he calculated that they would be near Okinoshima, a small island in the middle of the eastern strait, about halfway between Tsushima and the southwestern headlands of Nippon. At half-past one he was joined by Dewa's division of cruisers, and a few minutes later the divisions of Katioka and the younger Togo rejoined. They had till now hung on the flanks of the Russian advance. At a quarter to two the enemy's fleet came in sight, away to the southwestward of Okinoshima. Flags fluttered up to the signal yards of the Mikasa, and the fleet read with enthusiasm Togo's inspiring message. The rise or fall of the empire depends upon today's battle. Let every man do his utmost. He had been about ten miles north of Okinoshima at noon by which time he had steamed some ninety miles from Douglas Bay since 5 a.m. Thence he turned back slowly, going west and a little south, till he sighted the Russians. He crossed their line of advance diagonally at about 9,500 yards distance. His light cruiser divisions had received orders to steam southwards and attack the Russian rear, and were already well on their way. The heavy Japanese ships, circling on the left front of the enemy's advance, put on speed, and were evidently intending to recross the bows of the battleship division, bringing a converging fire to bear on the leading ships, the maneuver known as crossing the T.
As the Mikasa led the Japanese line on its turning movement, Rajdasvinsky swung round to starboard and opened fire at 8,500 yards. Togo waited till the distance had shortened to 6,500, and then the guns of the Mikasa flashed out. At that moment only three other of his ships had made the turn. They also opened fire, and ship after ship as she came round into line joined in the cannonade. The Russians turned more slowly, and it was some time before the whole of their line was in action. Meanwhile, a storm of fire had burst upon the leading ships of Rajdasvensky's lines. The Suvorov and the Oslyabya, at the head of the starboard and port divisions, being each made a target by several of the enemy. The Japanese gunners were firing with a rapidity that surprised even those who had been in the action of 10 August, and with much more terrible effect. In Captain Simonov's narrative of the fate of the Suvorov, we have a remarkably detailed description of the execution done by the Japanese shells in this first stage of the battle. The opening shots went high. They flew over the Suvorov, some of the big 12-inch projectiles turning over and over longitudinally in their flight. But at once Simonov remarked that the enemy were using a more sensitive fuse than on 10 August. Every shell as it touched the water exploded in a geyser of smoke and spray. As the Japanese corrected the range, shells began to explode on board or immediately over the deck, and again there was proof of the improved fusing. The slightest obstacle, the guy of a funnel, the lift of a boat derrick, was enough to burst the shell. The first fair hit was on the side, abreast of the forward funnel. It sent up a gigantic column of smoke, water, and flame. Then several men were killed or wounded near the forebridge, and then there was a crash beside one of the quick-firers, and the shell, bursting as it penetrated the deck, set the ship on fire. In the Battle of 10 August, the flagship Sarovich, which had borne the brunt of the Japanese fire, had been hit just nineteen times. But now that the Mikasa and her consorts had got the range, hit followed hit on the leading Russian ships. It seemed impossible, says Simonov, even to count the number of projectiles striking us. I had not only never witnessed such a fire before, but I had never imagined anything like it. Shells seemed to be pouring upon us incessantly one after another. The steel plates and superstructure of the upper deck were torn to pieces, and the splinters caused many casualties. Iron ladders were crumbled up into rings, and guns were literally hurled from their mountings. Such havoc would never be caused by the simple impact of a shell, still less by that of its splinters. It could only be caused by the force of the explosion. In addition to this, there was the unusually high temperature and liquid flame of the explosion, which seemed to spread over everything. I actually watched the steel plate catch fire from a burst. Of course the steel did not burn, but the paint on it did. Such almost incombustible materials as hammocks and rows of boxes drenched with water flared up in a moment. At times it was almost impossible to see anything with glasses, owing to everything being so distorted with the quivering heated air. No, it was different to the 10th of August. In this storm of fire there was heavy loss of life. A shell burst killed and wounded most of the signalers as they stood together at their station. An explosion against the opening of the conning tower killed two officers beside Raj Dysvensky and slightly wounded the admiral. The fight had not lasted more than twenty minutes, and the Suvorov, the Alexander, and Borodino, the three leading Russian ships, were all wrapped in black smoke from the fires lighted on board them by the Chimos shells. How was the Japanese line faring? I talked over his battle experiences with a Japanese officer not long after the day of Tsushima. He told me his impression was that at first the Russians shot fairly well, causing some loss of life at the more exposed stations on board the leading Japanese ships. But, he added, after the first twenty minutes they seemed suddenly to go all to pieces, and their shooting became wild and almost harmless. No wonder that under such a tornado of explosions, death and destruction, and with their ships ablaze, and range finding and firing control stations wrecked, the gunnery of the Russians broke down. One of the pithy sayings of the American Admiral Farragut was, The best protection against the enemy's fire is the steady fire of your own guns. Tsushima gave startling proof of it. Semenov hoped that the Japanese were also suffering from the stress of battle. From the forebridge of the Suvorov he scanned their line with his glasses. In the sea fights of other wars both fleets were wrapped in a dense fog of powder smoke, but now with the new powder there was no smoke except that of bursting shells and burning material. 
so he could distinguish everything plainly. The enemy had finished turning. His twelve ships were in perfect order at close intervals, steaming parallel to us, but gradually forging ahead. No disorder was noticeable. It seemed to me, with my Zeiss glasses, the distance was a little more than two miles, I could distinguish the mantlets of hammocks on the bridges and groups of men. But with us, I looked round. What havoc! Burning bridges, smoldering debris on the decks, piles of dead bodies, signaling and judging distance stations, gun-directing positions, all were destroyed. And astern of us, the Alexander and the Borodino were also wrapped in smoke. End of chapter 14, part 2